Before we start this session, a warning. If you're a professional baker or someone who actually knows what they're doing, someone who's interested in hydration levels and has serious questions about flour, I'm afraid that Pat Nurse, your host, is going to be a profound disappointment to you. I'm not only a non-baker, I'm actually a little bit frightened of baconing. Baconing. I don't even know the word. Baconing? What is that? I don't even know how to say baking. But Helen Go knows not only how to say baking, she knows how to bake. In fact, it's, she even has the word in her Instagram handle. Ah, look at me, I'm all at odds and sixes with all this baking talk. All I ask, ladies and gentlemen, is that you be gentle and uh, have patience with me as I ask some incredibly ham-fisted, dumb questions about baking. But stick with me, and by the end of it, I may be a convert. Helen Go, welcome Hello. to the Food Mind Festival, the online edition. Hello. Hi. <laughs> we made it. <laughs> we made it. So first off, uh, you know, clearly just any question about baking has scrambled my brain because I have to apologize to everyone who is looking to join us at 11 o'clock Greenwich Mean Time because I mucked it up. This is a family uh, hour, so I won't say what I really did, but I mucked it up. Um, so if you were expecting to see us in England, uh, an hour ago, my fault, my bad, but thank you for joining us. It is the correct time in Melbourne and here we are. That's cool because I got to clean the kitchen and then after cleaning the kitchen, I thought, oh, I can peel the, uh, uh, a bag of shallots that I've had sitting there for days. So there we go. it worked for me. Someone just gave me, a very kind soul just gave me a bag of trapea onions you know those sort of torpedo oh, yes. shallots yes. yeah i have no idea what to do with them oh they're really sweet aren't they that's the word and uh yeah. he he calls them the sex onions because some oh. italian researchers claim that they contain the same compounds that make viagra do what viagra does so, really where can i get some i should stay tuned <laughs> stay tuned i think ro roast them really gently i just eat them roasted i don't know what what, what are you thinking or salad? I, uh, I think salad. I think with that sweetness, they're probably going to be pretty good. Um, I think the I, they're from Calabria, I think, or the south yeah. in general. So I think um, the little research I've managed to do on them suggests that um, slow caramelization, simple pasta, that sort mm -hmm. of stuff is the go. So yeah. stay tuned. Have you been busy in the kitchen? Has this been a, a fertile period for you? Oh, gosh. Um, it's like everything. It just feels so polarized. You know, one in the beginning, I kind of felt like it was sort of quite blissful, you know, being in this sort of cocoon of home, but then also slightly terrified. It's like having a newborn in the house. You know, you can't go out and you're mm. sort of just there tending to sort of, you know, your own little thing. Um, and then I got, you know, a bit sick of that and started to sort of tinker around in the kitchen um, I mean, we were all a bit terrified of sort of going out shopping. So there was obviously limited things that we had to work, work on. I'm mm. in the middle of working on a book with your Tom and that sort of, I mean, I, I called him and said, oh my God, my, I mean, I'm just really not getting anything done with the kids at home. And he, well, actually I texted him at thinking this is just, I'm, I'm, just, I'm not going to meet the deadline. And he called straight away and said, um, I think you're suffering from Corona crisis. <laughs> Don't worry, we all are. Um, so it's very choppy at the moment. I am homeschooling, so I veer between sort of very intensely with the kids to thinking I'm cutting loose in the kitchen and just sort of going a bit crazy. And when I do my sort of um, shopping every few days, you know, I buy a lot more than I, than I really need. Mm. Um, and then it's kind of, well, it's fertile in that sense because I've got so much produce, but then it's also paralyzing because you think, you know, what the fuck am I going to make now? You know, I don't want to spoil it. <laughs> so. I had a win in the kitchen. I, I, I just, uh, I, you know, name drop alert. I just had a little chat to Mauro Colagreco earlier this evening and uh, a lovely man. And apart from being absolutely um, just so blown away by the blast of sunlight from uh, the Cote d'Azur, uh, I got inspired by seeing his garden, but I smashed some, some dinner between uh, 
uh, online festival engagements and um, had the last of the weekend uh, dinner party leftovers. So here in Victoria, uh, in the great city of Melbourne, um, we have just uh, restrictions have eased here enough that you can have um, six people over to your house. So, oh, six. That's, yeah. Okay. That's a party. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, no, no. It's a gathering. Oh, or gathering. oh sorry. Definitely, yes. definitely yes. not a party. Trouble. No, no, no. <laughs> um, it's a gather. Um, but we had some, yeah, we had the first friends that we had to the house since um, the lockdown began. It's very exciting because I've been vacuuming the house six to nine times a day. So the house has never been cleaner. So I was quite, quite pleased to show it off. Um, yeah. But I don't know, I broke all the rules. I did all the things you're not supposed to do when you're having people over. I did things that I'd never cooked before, you know, things that were kind of complicated. What did um, you do? Well, the, the friends I was having over, I know like Mexican food, but that I, that I don't like it too fancy maybe. So I was pitching nachos. Oh, um, yeah. Love but I ended But I ended up with more of a, I think my mood board was sort of half, um, chilaquiles, you know, the, yes. which I guess is the progenitor of nachos and yes. half, um, cochinita, al, uh, cochinita pabil, you know, which is, mm -hmm. I've never, I've spent a bit of time in Mexico. I've actually weirdly accidentally celebrated three birthdays there, but I've never been to Yucatan. Mm -hmm. Um, but I have this, I don't know if you've seen this book, uh, Yucatan by David Sterling. It is just extraordinary. It's, it's one of those cookbooks that, deeps that dives so deep into a place that you just can't you know you feel so immersed in the culture of that place so it's such an interesting cuisine you know it's got the everything you like about mexican food but with all those traditions coming in from the caribbean there's lots of allspice lots Gorgeous. of habaneros and yeah. it's it's sort of getting a little bit dark and cold in melbourne here so that blast mm. of flavor lots of citrus mm. um color i imagine bit... color too yeah absolutely well the so cochinita pabil, I think when they make it in Yucatan is it's almost got like a Mexican hangi kind of vibe. Like it's, mm. you know, wrapped in, wrapped in a whole lot of leaves, including banana leaves. It's got that achiote, so it's, sorry, anato, mm -hmm. so it has that really vibrant color. Um, and as I'm discovering, because every recipe in this book asks for it, they use a lot of Seville oranges, oh. which I think is kind of exciting. Yeah. Um, anyway. Not just marmalade then. <laughs> I know, I know. They're in season for like uh, a week here in Melbourne and I always buy them and don't really know what to do with them. So the answer, it turns out, is Caribbean Mexican food. Oh. Um, but anyway, it makes great leftovers. Uh, shredded up, you know, beautiful brick red, very flavoursome, fairly spicy pork. We didn't dig a pit in, our, uh, in the backyard of our rented uh, Fitzroy Terrace. Well, the thought that's, did cross my mind. Step next year that's the next step <laughs> but uh we charred a few things you know like with yeah. a lot of the cooking around there you start by like blackening the aromatics so made a fire in the backyard good times oh, sensational. What, is, what was the what was the last thing you cooked uh what did we oh we had um uh soy chicken last night mm. but I, I well i did do the prep i told you about this um my my shallot so i'm prepping for some acha um, nice. So I'll work. Yeah, thought that's some way to get some veggies into me. And and it's one of the great leftovers dishes of all time. Is that there's pretty much nothing that you can't add soy chick cold soy chicken to. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it was it's been a bit sort of, you know, cooking around the kids at the moment. Um, yeah. Which is, yeah. I mean, the challenge is trying to find something that we can all sit down to at the same time. I saw you post on Instagram a. Um, less spicy mapo dofu the other day oh yeah <laughs> it didn't quite hit the spot for me <laughs> i have to say i remember um I, I interviewed um a sydney chef peter kuravita years ago and and um peter's family is sri lankan he's sri lankan australian but his dad uh lived some of his adult life in london in the, the 70s and he he, re mm. he related the story to me of his dad sort of getting through these dinner parties with what seemed to him to be incredibly bland food by pulling chilies that he had secreted in his pockets and just quietly yeah. munching them throughout the course yeah. of the meal i get that 
chili and Vegemite. That's always my, that's my back pocket. Yeah. I'm down, I'm down. <laughs> um, we're, we're a bit of the way to the conversation. I haven't really done the, uh, here's someone who needs no introduction kind of spiel, but when you, when you meet someone on an airplane and you don't manage to sort of signal to them that you don't particularly want to talk to them, or maybe you do want to talk to them, and they ask you what you do, how do you, how do you describe your, your job, your profession? Oh, God. That's always, how do I describe? Well, uh, I think the simplest um, thing to say would be I, I'm a recipe developer for Ottolenghi. And sometimes they know Ottolenghi and then the questions just come, <laughs> you know, what recipes they'd like in which book, what's he like? And like, screw this, help. Yeah. And then sometimes it's like, oh, what, you know, sort of starting, starting from scratch, what exactly do you do? I write recipes or I write uh, recipes for a column. Um, it used to be more complicated than that because for a long time I was on that sort of um, precipice between psychology and cooking. Actually, for a long time, for many years, sometimes it was more psychology and then you know, sort of I moonlighted as a chef or cook. And sometimes I was cooking full time. And then quickly, if I had, you know, a, a patient to see, I'd kind of, you know, get out of my chef's whites and sort of go into my consulting room. So yeah, but now it's pretty much cooking. So that, that makes it yeah, quite a lot easier to describe. I develop recipes. Yeah, I cook. Helen, uh... I think it's very interesting that you, you use the word precipice there when you're describing your career choices. Could you, uh, could we expand on that a little bit? Well, that was I guess my best a... psychologist voice, by the way. Sorry? That was my best psychologist voice, by the way. Did oh. it work? <laughs> well, I noticed that also, that very sort of Freudian yeah. little that gesture too. That, that always get, gets you to dig, dig a bit deeper. Um, I guess the thing about the word precipice is sort of this kind of inherent danger in a precipice. You know, there's sort of something very exciting, but there's also that danger. And I think it's, you know, in psychology, it's a bit of a cliche that the Chinese word for, or the Chinese character for um, crisis is made up of two other characters, which is um, opportunity and danger. So I've always seen that duality to my life where this opportunity to kind of break away and what's the danger, you know, for both the careers, actually. I mean, I love them both. I love psychology and I love um, cooking. And then for, for a long time, I think there was this sort of pressure to make a decision, to make a choice, one or the other. And then I think I just thought, actually, I don't need to make a decision. I can just sort of go along until it kind of defines itself. And that's kind of pretty much how I've always operated. You know, I don't have grand plans. I don't have, I'm not really a very ambitious person at all. I just kind of stay close and wait for the next thing to come. And then I think when you're, it's a kind of definition of flow. When you're in the flow of something, the next thing you do presents itself. So you don't have to think very hard. And I think it's something I've learned from psychology. You know, you try not to preempt your patients um, issues you let them unfold and you just stay very very close and and somehow the issues reveal themselves when you stay close and i think for life and career choices i feel it's the same thing that you just stay close be present and then the next thing sort of reveals and you're just more present to be able to respond to it um now i feel like i've not really answered your question what was the question <laughs> I, I, well, there wasn't a question. I just asked you, in a sense, I just asked you to expand on that. Can we revisit that? Yeah. It, um, it does remind me a little bit of uh, my life as a journalist. And they, when, you, when you're trained initially, they talk about the difference between a good conversation and a good interview. And mm -hmm. one of the, and I, I assume there's, a, there's some parallels here with psychology as well. It's quite difficult to break yourself out of the habit of um, particularly in a, an interview that there's more for material to be using in a written story, the habit of trying to be likable and trying to fill silences and do all those sorts of things. Um, you know, if, you know, one of the great tools you have as an interviewer is um, the ability to shut up. Or not. I mean, I have to say time and time again in my own transcription, 
I'm listening back and the person I'm, I'm interviewing is about to, you could hear it, they're about to say something really fantastic. The quote, the headline is about to come through. And then just as they're about to say it, this voice comes in and blah, 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 blah with a completely different train of thought. And I'm just like, oh, yeah. why? Yeah, but then it also is more natural though, isn't it? I mean, I berate myself all the time with that, with psychology, you know, when I'm with a patient and you just somehow I've in you know, injected myself in there just at the wrong moment. But then I think, well, it's kind of natural as well. There's something just more organic about that, right? Yeah. So. Now, I, uh, I was saying as I started that I'm, I'm new to this Zoom thing and uh, one of the things I'm learning is you have this weird moment where you're tinkering with the camera and you're pressing live, but it actually yeah. goes live before it tells you it goes live. So you have to yes. be getting space on. And ready before it happens. I was hoping and you then... to pose on your Instagram picture. That's uh, <laughs> uh, what is Ergon? Um, isn't that the from Ratatouille? The guy, the guy from Ratatouille. Yeah. <laughs> the frightening thing is, I'm each year, each passing year, I look more like my Instagram picture, which is a bit of a worry. <laughs> Sorry, my um, Twitter picture. Um, be careful what you choose there. Well, this uh, is my very first, first ever live. I had to go and buy a tripod. Well, actually, I called some people and said, what do I do? Um, and they said, look, everyone else does it. You know, idiots do it. So you'll be fine. I thought, I really <laughs> don't know. <laughs> so I did buy. Thank goodness it arrived on time because I arrived yesterday. And I feel very guilty. I mean, these Amazon parcels. But anyway, um, so now it's like a new frontier having this. I, <laughs> I was doing it on a pile of books for the first couple. And I have to say, oh, yeah. a tripod frees up your hands and, and makes you feel very professional. So this is, this is the new frontier. Yes. Um, in, in my attempt at uh, some introductory patter though, while I was trying to rig the technology with the other two thirds of my brain, I touched on the idea or the truth in fact, that I'm not much of a baker. I, I'm a, I love cooking. I cook all day long at the moment, except when I'm working, if you're listening work, I'm working all the time, very hard. 9 p.m. at night on a Tuesday night. <laughs> but the rest of the time I'm actually cooking. Um, and, but I, I am a little bit frightened of the measuring styles of cooking. And I, in that I would, I would include baking and, and um, pastry. You know, I, I, don't, I like making desserts, but my desserts tend to be pieces of fruit cut up and things put on them or, or not no, very much like that. Kind. That's the best kind. But you know, I, people people ask say that to me all the time. Oh, I'm I'm a good cook. I'm a competent cook. But oh, I'm I'm really terrified of baking. And lately, I I've been thinking, well, what is it about baking? And so you've said it's the measuring. And conversely, I think in fact, when I was a very insecure chef, I probably still am. But when when I was a very insecure chef starting out, I think it was the idea that you could measure, that you didn't have to use this ineffable thing like your senses to say whether that's right or not you know like with a lot of cooking it always says you know a season to taste well what's it meant to taste like but with pastry and cake and baking it tells you exactly I mean the caveat here obviously is that you need a bloody good recipe and I think a lot of people get put off um, because they've had a recipe and it's not you it's the recipe <laughs> but if you have a good solid recipe it's it's if you can read, you can you can cook because there's it's just me, yeah. following the steps. Absolutely, there's hope. Yeah, I did think you it's, read, it's so Did you ever read um, Julian Barnes, The Pedant in the Kitchen? Yes. Well, I think Wonderful. I just looked at the name. I identified, and so thought that's that's for me. But actually, I found it quite hard going. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, yeah. his his. I mean, he. But I mean, for me, he really sort of made concrete that sort of paralysis that yes cooks who don't have the flow suffer and it made me it made me i mean i i, I read it when i was working at gourmet traveler it really made me think differently about recipe writing i mean recipe writing is such a particular um discipline i mean because i've been doing so much cooking and working um while we've been on lockdown I've been revisiting a lot of my old favorites, but I've been reading some other new books and um, particularly doing the kind of cooking that everyone's maybe talking about in lockdown where we're trying new things or we're trying to make things from scratch. 
that safe pair of hands feeling, you know, goes so far. I mean, I, I um, was prepping some anchovies the other day. Uh, I was just, I bought some salted anchovies in a big, big tin from a, a Greek uh, supermarket here in the northern suburbs of Melbourne. Shout out to Saracos, love your stuff. Um, and you know, I've seen people do this a hundred times. You know, you you pull the you pull the anchovy out, you brush the salt off, peel it open after you've soaked it, pull out the spine, fill it, clean it, stick it in some oil. Incredible. I'm salivating. You know, like, I'm salivating. This, and the the big tin is, I mean, this is a half kilo tin for fifteen Australian dollars. You know, yeah, compare yeah. that to the fifteen dollars you pay for insert brand here, fancy yeah. anchovy. So the value proposition is there, but as I was sort of looking around the internet, you know, I found some pretty good sources, but I ended up going with um, uh, Judy Rogers' Zuni Cafe book. Yes, love and you that. Just think, you know, her, the power of her ability to observe what matters and what doesn't comes through so strongly in those yes. books. I mean, I am going to potentially get a lot of people offside by saying this, but I have a lot of cookbooks. These are almost all cookbooks here, and there's another shelf there that's cookbooks. But these are the reading cookbooks. The cooking mm -hmm. cookbooks are in a shelf next to the kitchen. And almost all of the cooking cookbooks are not restaurant books. Mm -hmm. um, Judy Rogers' Zuni Cafe book, I think, is, is one of the exceptions that proves the, rob, that proves the rule. Uh, the St. John cookbook, um, yeah. I think, is, is right up there because... Uh, you know, too often, and I guess you guys, you know, are really well drilled in this. People have that restaurant layout, that restaurant, you know, oh, there's five people who can do the washing up for me. You know, you look, yeah. you read some of those recipes where they say, do this in two pans, and you think, hey, man, I got to wash those pans up. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, whereas. No, accessibility in the kitchen is everything. But, you know, your. Um, anchovy thing prompted me you when you asked me what i've been cooking i'll tell you what i've been cooking can i move this camera I'm, this is you all can new. do whatever you want i'm going to move this and show you something yeah. i'm going to turn it around i'm going to turn it around look at my this is what we've oh, been cooking. wow <laughs> so what i've been doing what i've been doing with that um the kids have been they're crazy for sushi and um i had this sort of irrational probably irrational thing that I shouldn't be, um, you know, buying raw fish, you know, uncooked produce or buying sushi for that matter. Just, you know, all the hands sort of being involved. So we thought, OK, we'll, we'll make sushi, but we'll um, we'll put tuna, you know, tin tuna. So that's how many tins we've gone through in lockdown so far. And, and one tin goes a long way <laughs> because it's, you know, wrapped up in the in the sushi. But, yeah, I salivate just the thought of the, you know, anchovies. Yeah. What um, what what culinary skills are you are you most hoping to pass on to the kids? Oh gosh, you know they're so different. I've got one who is sort of um, loves uh, sort of crisp, sour, so salady, crunchy fruits and vegetables, and the other one just wants beige food, you know, sort of pasta, you know, pasta with cheese, or preferably just pasta with butter. You know, that would be mm -hmm. his. But lately we've been making, um, I don't know if you've got the book, J.J. McFadden's, um, is it called Six Seasons? No. It's a place called Ava Jean's in Portland. I've not been, but right, I yeah. saw, um, it was written up, Ajitej Alreo, I think, from the New York Times wrote about this um, kale pesto. It sounds terrible, but it is glorious. And um, it's really, uh, I, we put, I sneak it into everything. So I make pasta but then I put the kale sauce on it it's bright green it's fluorescent and they they eat it so that's my way of sort of satisfying the one who likes vegetables and the ones who, the one who likes sort of um pasta but in terms of what would I like to pass on to them I think actually eating well more than cooking because I think if you if you have this sensibility of eating well you'll cook well um so, I, you know, I don't rush them into the kitchen. In fact, they're a bit of a nuisance in the kitchen. Um, occasionally, you know, it, it just requires me to sort of suspend all my um, 
irritation and patience, you know, and I make a blob of dough for them. I don't expect it to turn out. I just let them sort of tinker with me in the kitchen. But I think particularly with my older son, you know, and actually the little one is starting to as well, where I, we, we, if we, when we go out, you know, I really, um, I, I, what I love is seeing them enjoy food. That's, that's the primary thing. And I think the rest will, will take care of itself. Yeah. What sort of eater were you as a girl? Um, oh, well, I, yeah, I guess, Mal you know, growing up in Malaysia, you know, it, you eat nonstop. I mean, this sort of sensibility of sort of um, eating one thing and then while you're eating that, planning your next meal. And I think growing up, you know, it's, it's, it's not just nothing, but it's quite common to cycle five miles to get something and come back and all eat a hot breakfast. And the breakfast would be noodles, you know, hot noodles. <laughs> so it was quite a culture shock to sort of move to Australia. And then, you know, having, I mean, you, I, we sort of endured this embarrassment of having lap chong and rice, you know, in our lunches. And then after a while, mum, caught on and started giving us, um, you know, those chicken loaf sandwiches. Mm, delicious. Well, I, I, we, that's all we wanted, you see, for a long time. And then after a while, it was like, oh, maybe, maybe the noodles were quite good after all. Um, so we grew up very, um, uh, you know, mum only cooked Asian food. We, the, the oven was used to stash things like salted fish and, you know, really funky balachan pastes. So she never baked, never used the oven. Um, the dishwasher, we didn't use either. That was to store big pots and pans. And then moving to Australia, I think you were just so, um, not just interested to discover new things, but genuinely uh, you wanted to fit in. So I wanted to eat what everybody else wanted to eat. And, you know, one of my first sort of play dates was sort of going down to Lawn with a friend um, to her family's holiday, holiday house. And I remember the mother, we had baked potatoes and there was a, a tub of sour cream, a, a bowl of sour cream in the, in the middle of the table. And I genuinely just had no idea what to do with it and just kind of furtively watching what everyone's doing. And even cutlery you know we didn't you I didn't know really how to use cutlery properly and I mean I'm embarrassed to say this is I'm 15 at this stage you know so I'm not nine <laughs> so there was a lot of learning and then obviously just this proliferate just this you know this coming out I mean I still think Australia has the best food in the world you know um by the time I had my private practice, I never started before 11 because I'm not a morning person. My first patient would be 11. I, and I also timed it so I could drive down Victoria Street and get my fur, you know, on the way, on the way um, to work, which was in, um, Lig not Ligon Street, what is it, Grattan Street in Carlton. And then popping it down to, you know, get something else to eat, go to, I've forgotten the names, it's all escaping me, but, you know, you're, sandwich at um what's that big fantastic place that uh not brunetti is it brunetti yeah, yeah 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 brunetti you know getting my mortadella sandwich at brunetti so i would say i was you know by the time in my 20s i felt like i had a good repertoire of things that i loved and cooked and ate yeah and i think that's also a particular luxury of living in australia as well what um, what do the kids think of Australia? Oh, paradise! <laughs> you know, when you move to England, people say, "What are you? Do You're Australian? Oh, what are you doing here?" <laughs> you know, and the kids for a long time. I mean, we we obviously come quite a lot. I mean, both David's and my family are in Australia. Um, they, yeah, it's it's. But I mean, I guess they associate it with holidays being spoilt by grandparents and aunties and uncles, uh, beach houses, you know, so it's, it's another world. Yeah. Sounds okay. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> and when you're away from London, what do you miss from London? Um, I think the insularity a, a bit, you know, it's quite, I mean, it's, it's so very, it is so vast. It is so, there's so much out there, whether it's, theater or restaurants but 
it, it, it's for me anyway, it's a, because I didn't grow up here. So I'm not so conversant with sort of getting around, you know, I don't ride a bike and um, it's, I find it, you have to plan for it. And mm. I'm a fairly spontaneous person. And I find that it's a bit tricky, this idea of sort of planning. Uh, so I think there's something quite insular about our lives in, in, uh, in London. We don't have uh, sort of the family gatherings. Of course, we have friends and we do things together, but it feels more, there's, some, there's something of a sanctuary in, in London, where we live in London. And then when you come out and you want to go to the theatre and have a night out, you know, at a bar or whatever, it feels properly like you're, like you're going out. Yeah. So, um, it's again, quite sort of polarised, you know, home life and then there's sort of the big smoke. When you're, I mean, when you're not in, you know, the midst of a global pandemic, shall we say, Yes. What, what is your London? What are your regulars? What is in your, your village, your neighbourhood? I, I try and pick it along where my train line goes. And thankfully, it's a very easy, it's not exactly short, but it's a very easy journey to St. John. That would be, you know, sort of the place that I would love that. For lunch, for dinner, to, you know, get an Eccles cake for afternoon tea. Um, I love that. I'm in West London. I mean, I'd love to be in East London, Shoreditch, where I think all the, you know, great new places are. Um, it's what I miss, really miss about Melbourne is just the uh, very accessible Vietnamese, which in West mm. London, it's not so, it's, it's, it's not easy. And getting to East London is, is not easy for me. So I'm, I'm beginning to sound very old. <laughs> No, I, getting from getting from East London to West London is a right. huge pain in the ass. Yeah, like, it's a palaver. You know, yeah, forget about it. Yeah. Um, one of the great, one of the, you know, the, we take our silver linings where we can get them these days, I guess. But um, one of the big ones in the food scene in Melbourne in the last couple of months, for the last few weeks, even has been that um, T Lee, the chef at Anchovy, which is a, a modern Vietnamese restaurant in Richmond that you might be familiar with, yes. uh, has done a a pivot or a side project where she's been um, doing banh mi out, out the window on the oh, weekend. Oh my God, that's my and, dream. <gasps> you know, like uh, you probably, you know, people in your universe have, you probably had the misfortune of encountering people trying to fancy up the Vietnamese sandwich, you know, in your life. And, you know, they put it on fancy bread or they put it on sourdough. Yes, just, no, yes. no, 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 no. no. T isn't doing any of that. So she's, she's kind of giving a, a Lao spin. But the thing that I think really elevates these is she's putting things on them hot from the grill. So she's got a charcoal oh, grill amazing. there in the window. She's got all the good bar me stuff. She's got the pickles, oh. she's got the, the bread that falls apart, that whole stuff. And then she's putting hot Lao sausage. Uh, oh she's God. putting grilled ox tongue. Uh, the other day, and I cannot believe I missed this, but she had... Um, freshly she, she had a suckling pig that she'd cooked on a pile of bricks out in the back of the, the restaurant and they were stripping the meat and putting that on sorry my eyes are bugging out here you are me. you are torturing me right but, now i mean i i hope that you know not that people should be ripping off t's idea but how oh good like i hope everyone does this immediately if you're listening world the one yes. takeaway you should take from the melbourne side of this conversation is hot grilled things on Vietnamese or Lao sandwiches. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, well, when the festival was still going ahead, I had planned on the first night upon arrival uh, with Arden Burnoff. Arden, I don't know if you're listening. Say hello if you are. Um, and she said, where do you want to eat? And I said, anchovy. I've not been actually, mm. but that sounds right up my alley. So... Um, and then, of course, when there was word that it was cancelled, the first thing was, oh, no, anchovy. <laughs> Sorry, not Melbourne Food and Wine Festival. No, it was. <laughs> we, um, anchovy. It's, and I'm, I'm completely with you. You've jumped ahead. That was one of my questions, Helen. It's, it's what's, what's your first stop when you get to Melbourne? I can, I can vouch for anchovy. I am a recent, uh, recently minted Melbourneian. This is my first year in Melbourne. And I, my first birthday in Melbourne as a Melbourneian, I celebrated that anchovy and it was Did you? Right. fantastic. Yes. Yeah. The crab noodles, my God. Yeah. Sounds amazing. She's yeah. super gifted. They would have had to have been Vietnamese and particularly anchovy because it's sort of Vietnamese, but also, you know, I also like to um, learn something or see something new. And I think that just sort of 
it just seems to have everything from you know what I've seen and what I've read and heard about yeah swerve tangent pivot yeah how much did your household tahini consumption increase when you joined the Otolenghi organization not very much because I've been on this kind of sweet side of things in more, than, more ways than one. I've been extraordinarily lucky. When I joined, one of the things that caught my eye were the, was that salad display. And so even though my CV at the time was sort of more baking, when I joined, I, you know, I remember having my um, meeting, my, my um, interview with your tum right there at the Notting Hill store. And we were just outside, just standing outside, just because it happened to be a really nice day in June. And, um, and he, I guess, immediately said, well, you know, we, we, we do a lot of cakes. And I said, well, do you think I could do the salads? You know, I think that's what I'd, I'd really like to, like to do. Um, but it was very, very hard work because, um, you know, I don't know if you've seen those salads, but they're massive. And it's mm. just chopping, chopping, chopping all day, which was great. I learned so much but then i very quickly transitioned to the sweet section and at that time why didn't we but there wasn't a lot of tahini in the in the cakes now there are you know we have our millionaires shortbread with tahini and tahini's uh, short uh, cookies um but so no not really and i think of sesame paste along the chinese lines mm. you know with, with noodles um so i'm tahini is not one of my go-to tastes you know, I know with my Otolenghi family, I know, heresy, my Otolenghi family, that's their, that's their go-to. Um, but it's, it's not mine. What's, yeah. um, it, it, this, this falls into potentially the uh, what are your influences school of uh, interviewing, but what are your go-tos? What's in your speed rack in your kitchen? It's so eclectic. And recently I've become a little bit, and actually I, be interested your take on this 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 very vexatious notion of cultural appropriation you know I go anywhere there's good food and and, and you know sometimes I make recently I've discovered sort of Filipino um, pantry and I learned about this um, I can't remember the name Tolong Tarong it's the aubergine that you um, uh, burn on the stovetop like, as if you're making halfway to making baba ganoush Mm. But then you don't break it up and you just sort of press it to get rid of all the liquid from the eggplant. And then you put minced meat on it and an egg on a plate and you slide the whole thing into a saucepan. So it's kind of baba ganoush meets frittata. Mm. And it's a, a very, um, sorry, very Filipino thing. I'd never seen it and I'd read about it somewhere and I thought I've got to try it. But then I don't know I, if you can see the comments here, Helen, but it's lighting up with uh, Filipino uh, oh, right. people in the session just going, yes. Oh, really? Okay. Well, see, partly I love that. And I think Instagram gives you that um, arena to dialogue with people. And I'm learning, loving, uh, loving learning from, from, from them. And so what I learned when I posted on that was that ah but that's not the whole mccoy you know, the full mccoy you have to have banana ketchup which is a uh, ketchup made with bananas so that's on my little pile of recipes to try next so sorry your question about what my go-to it's it's so broad and i you know when i started the instagram thing and i was very very late to it people said to me the advice was pick your thing and stay with your thing and I thought, I don't know what my thing is, you know? I mean, yes, I bake, I love to bake, but I love to do all sorts of other things as well. And um, so, you know, so there was a lot of pressure to kind of define your area. And I thought, I can't, I, I, you know, here's that word, authentic. I thought, I, that's not really authentic to me. I don't have an area. I just kind of respond if something catches my fancy, you know, it could be something I've eaten or something I've seen in a magazine. I'll immediately sort of rustle, try and sort of uh, cook or get closer towards understanding that, that thing, whatever it may be. 
And so recently it was this uh, Tolong, someone can correct me, Tolong Tarong, Tarong Tolong. Uh, I have it right here from the uh, fantastic Melbourne Filipino food crew, the entrepreneurs, Totang uh, Tolong. And I'm sorry, yeah. guys, because yeah. I know I mispronounced right. that. Yeah. I just um, love the idea of it and I love the execution of it, all the whole thing sliding onto a plate and it works. You know, I think someone on my, uh, my uh, Instagram said, uh, you know, but, but surely can you give us the steps? Surely you, it doesn't just happen. It does. It does just happen. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, so many influences. And then, and then I worry as well, this very thorny subject of cultural appropriation. I mean, what does that even mean? Uh, I mean, I, I'd really love to hear your, you know, your take on this. I think, I mean, I think it's really interesting coming from somewhere like Malaysia where you have so many different um, streams of cultures and foods flowing together. And sometimes they're, um, you know, sometimes they sit separately and sometimes they cross over. But there's a, in, you know, probably not everywhere in Malaysia, but certainly in some of the places where I've eaten the best food, like in Georgetown in Penang. Yeah. People there have cultural fluency uh, across yeah. all of these different cultures. And it's, it just doesn't seem to be a stay in your lane sort of thing. You know, like yeah. uh, one of my very favorite people in Georgetown is a, a fantastic cooking teacher called Pearly Key. Um, Pearlie is a Nonya. Her husband, Chandra, is, um, his heritage is Indian. Uh, he's a postman. He knows everyone in Georgetown. And they cook across the spectrum. You know, they do the whole thing and they always have. You know, they always have. So um, I haven't got a good answer for that one, but it doesn't describe my life. Yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, I maybe it, maybe it makes more sense coming out of the US. Like maybe the US in the yes, US things it's a, it's are a, a bit more I particular. Think. But I mean, I don't, you know, I don't. My parents were not particularly cosmopolitan in their cooking. They're both, um, you know, Anglo Australians. Uh, didn't travel a lot, but in the kitchen at home, the soy sauce sat next to the olive oil, yes. sat, ne sat next to the, you know, the Blat Chan, there's, yeah. there's the wok, you know. I mean, I went to university in Bathurst a long, long time ago. And Bathurst is not the centre of, you know, exciting cultural diversity in Australia. Maybe it is now. It certainly wasn't then. And mm. you could buy fresh gal and gal at the really? supermarket. Yeah, yeah. You know that's I mean? amazing. Yeah. It's, I, yeah, look, I mean... It's a complicated question, but I think the story in Australia maybe is more nuanced than in some other right. parts of the world. But yes, I think I maybe think... I think it's quite a distinct American thing. I think they're a little more sort of it's more a thorny subject there. Here, I just I guess I just feel it would be such a shame to lose that, as you say, fluency, and not to be sort of circumscribed by you know the culture that you grew up with, or you know. And I think in a way I've been very lucky because you know this you know, because I am Asian, yes, can I dabble in Indonesian and Filipino without sort of, you know, people checking up what my credentials are to do that. Um, but actually they are. I mean, I've got heaps to learn with, um, I mean, Filipino is my, my new thing because I, it's, for me, I had this very unfair and it's all to do with my own um, ignorance. You know, I, I, all I knew was sort of seven up chicken, you know, um, which is ridiculous. And, and what, what that drink, hello, hello, you know, which is really chendol or ice kacang for me. It's, it's my way of understanding. Careful, it. careful. I know, I know. Well, see this, see, this is the other thing. I mean, that's kind of my way of trying to understand something. It's like this very Piagetian notion of um, assimilation and accommodation. What do you assimilate to your prior knowledge to learn about something? So for me, I know it's sort of, you know, um, vexatious to sort of say, oh, that's ice kacang. <laughs> but actually, that's my way of learning it, th that mm. I have a c comparison. And then from there, I learn, oh, what, what do the Filipinos do differently? Or what do the Indonesians do differently? And I think that's just such a great platform to, to, to sort of bounce off, you know, start with some knowns, add your unknowns, and then create your own sort of little thing. 
Um, I think that's, that's kind of how it has to be, right? Yes. At, yeah. at the beginning anyway. Um, I, you know, people are getting angry every time I talk because they only want to hear from you and that's, that's oh, totally... No, 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 keep uh, talking, please. I, <laughs> this is new, I get nervous. I, 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 well, your time I actually called and I was like, run me through how to do this quickly. And I said, I think I need a drink. He said, well, it's 11 o'clock in the morning, but I made myself a rewash tea. And then I thought, well, there's an amaretto. I put some amaretto in there. It was so delicious. So I texted him afterwards, there's a cake in this, amaretto and rewash cake coming up. <laughs> I'm into that. You heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I, I have selfish, I have a selfish, uh, you know, ulterior motive here. What should I do to, as the, the non baker, the, the timid baker, but the, the interested baker to sort of dip the toe? I mean, what, what in your repertoire have you found to be, you know, the best baby steps from, yeah. from the recipes that you published? What have people said, hey, this is really, you know, this has really given me some confidence and maybe some recipes that you know to be particularly robust that even I can't fuck up? You know what? This is really, really boring, but this is my honest answer. It's the tiny, tiny things. Like I honestly grew a foot taller when I discovered this myself. It's the tiny things like um, that you, you always skip through in cookbooks, which is take your butter out at room temperature, have it at room temperature. Because when you have butter that is rock hard and you're trying to cream it, you will never get that lift. Or when you quickly try and do it in the microwave, you've got puddles and you won't get that lift because you know it's, it's melted, melted butter. So it's the little things like taking the time to grease your pan, you know, either lining it with um, greaseproof paper, really take the time to, to do that properly. Uh, and if you're going to use one of those fancy Nordic ware, not an ad, although I do love the Nordic ware pan, so yes, do. <laughs> I'm happy to receive any, but take the time to brush it carefully with not melted, not hard butter, but room temperature butter, so that you can cover every crevice. When you use melted butter, when you, by the time you put the tin back on the table or the bench, the butter will pull to the you know, to the middle, and then you'll have clumps. But if you use just barely softened butter and you brush every crevice and you um, flour the pan and tap off the excess, that is going to make the difference with, between the cake coming out or not coming out. The, it's the tiniest little things. Mm. Um, I mean, it sounds really boring, but I think I grew a foot myself. Um, not the foot coming out of my mouth, but, uh, you know, just, I just, when gained I, that confidence. When, that gain, when I gained that confidence and saw that things turn out, gosh, it, it makes you want to do it more and more. And of course, it's just that practice of doing it. Um, and, and oftentimes, it is also about understanding uh, your own, um, your, your own, your own oven, your stovetop. Um, the, the, the small things like that. Here's and, and a crispy one for you, actually. Go Pardon on. me for interrupting. Yes. We live in a house where the oven, get this, switches itself off. Oh, do, you, do you have any really great steamed cakes in the repertoire? You know, just to look to the sort of the, the Malaysian side of things, perhaps? Like, oh, yes, I a... do. But then you need a wok and a thing to steam it properly. Ah, these things right. I have because I live yes. in Australia. Oh, well, tapioca cakes are beautiful. Um, well, you need glutinous rice flour for that. And uh, once I live that, in Melbourne. I can get that. That's easy. You can. Yeah. Although you could probably just buy that as well in Melbourne. That's true. That's true. Yeah. But um, an oven that switches itself off, meringues. That's ah. perfect for meringues. <laughs> um, what, do you, what do you miss from the mortar and pestle days? Oh my God. I mean, recently I had um, one of the chefs um, contact me on Instagram and he said, um, oh, you know, I have such fond memories. And every time somebody says that word, I cringe because I just behaved so badly during those days. I mean, I was so obsessed um, and so very insecure that I just, you know, uh, it was just so intense. Um, I, rem I remember, 
and I just took everything so personally because I really poured everything into that tiny cafe and having come from sort of no experience to just doing that, the, the lunacy, the idiocy. <laughs> uh, and so in my head, I was like, bloody hell, it's here now, we've opened now, I cannot fail. So I was up all hours of the night, you know, and I lived above the shop, I would put cakes in the oven, you know, set a timer, go to bed, come down, take, take it out put another batch in. And I remember um, somebody placed an order and it was for a, some event. And she, you know, uh, came to collect them and it was all going in the boot of a car. And I was just so horrified that, you know, I'd plated them all carefully and it was all going into this, into the boot of the car. And she called me, you know, 20 minutes later and said, it's all run into each other. And I remember saying, well, what do you expect? And I remember saying, don't come into my shop again. I mean, he, I mean, I'm cringe, I cringe. I mean, I'm that typical temperamental, um, I, it really came from a place of lack of confidence. You know, I, I overworked and just, just took it all so personally that if somebody complained about a, a cake, then they were really criticizing me. So thankfully I've kind of, gotten over sort of that phase but it was pretty intense so my immediate association when you ask about mortar and pestle is um cringe yeah they put the cakes in the boot helen well right that's I mean, crazy yeah there are some there are some people commenting that they they are former uh mortar and pestle customers here um i'm assuming oh, really? they're not those customers well, if I ever shouted at you, please forgive me. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> but it was also the springboard for a lot of things because it was from there. You know, because Stephanie's um, the restaurant was up the road, and mm. the and, and the chefs used to come to the cafe to Mortar and Pestle for their sort of during their break, and uh, one of them was Dure Dara, and Ooh, she wow. yeah. So Dure came nearly every day. And um, so when, I, and she, she heard everything, you know, she would come into the You kitchen. didn't yell at her, did you? Oh, no, no, but she was always yelling at me. <laughs> but she would come into the kitchen and say, no, Helen, <laughs> in her very authority. I mean, I was terrified of her, terrified. Rightly so. But when, um, the, honest, honestly, the day that we announced that we were going to close, or we actually sold it, we were very lucky that we had, we had a buyer who wanted to pay us for that cruddy little, little, the, the little shoebox. But Dure called me immediately and said, meet me outside now. Now, of course, you do exactly what Dure says, right? So I met her outside and she said, um, you cancel everything. You are just staying with me. She just had this utter confidence in me. And to this day, I have no idea how or why. But she, um, yeah, so she got me on, her pro on a project to do, to consult for the noodle bar in, um, was it Burke or Collins? I think it's Burke, Burke Street. Um, and I spent, you know, weeks saying, I can't do it, Dure, no, you've got the wrong person, I can't do it. And she just shut up and do it. <laughs> So I did it, which was kind of developing recipes um, for the for Noodle Bar, which was great fun, but also terrifying, you know, working for her. Um, and then I spent nine months, I think, behind the walks cooking at Noodle Bar. And then after that, when I wanted to move, she said, well, look, you know, I think at that time she was a um, shareholder or a partner at Donovan's. And I said, look, I really want to learn. I mean, I'm sick of feeling this sort of insecurity. You know, I really want to learn. And she said, okay, stay with me. I've got the perfect spot for you. And so there I was meeting Gail and Kevin. Um, and, and, you know, again, I said, can I, I'll start in, uh, you know, doing anything, washing parsley. And I think it was my second or third day when the pastry chef did, had done a runner and they put me in there. And yeah, so I... <laughs> just stayed on i think they call that the deep end yeah the the yeah well more i could use <laughs> more colorful <laughs> words than that it was a shit show <laughs> but i learned heaps and that was exactly what i wanted well you know the the 
that opportunity to kind of work in a formalish brigade. Um, but it wasn't sort of formal French food, but the hierarchies were there, you know, the sous chef, mm. and, you know, chef de parties. And so I, I learned a lot and not least, and I still think that, you know, I think that the culture for me at Donovan's was you do whatever you have to do to make the customer happy. And I needed to learn that because I was so sort of, um, I was such a punk, you know, coming from mortar and pestle where I had no idea what the rules were. I just made it up as I went along. And we had um, Andrew Wong um, beaming in oh. from London on Monday. And Best Chinese in London. Best Chinese in London. I, I, it's, it was 10 o'clock when the session, 10 o'clock in the evening when the session ended, he was talking to Victor Leong from um, Li Ho Fook here. And yes. I was just so craving dim sum by the end of it. But he said one of the big revelations for him getting into professional cooking was realizing that pretty much everyone's winging it you know they're and right. they're all they're all doing yeah. it their own way they're all doing it a different way and you've just got to kind of go for it yes you know? well i think That's it's for a bit it's, of it isn't it nice to hear somebody like that say that because i think that there's a there's a big part of it you know to, uh, uh, that we are just you know finding our feet and and I, I think I think one of the nice things about uh, positive things that things that have come out of the lot of, of this virus is that well, you do have to make it up a bit. You do have to try new things and change it. And it's not seen. In fact, I think was it in your conversation with Rene Redzepi that he said, um, you know, be prepared to be fluid, be prepared to change, and go with the flow a bit. Because I think traditionally it's seen as either. Um, that you don't know what you're doing, you know, you don't have a vision if you're chopping and changing, or that something's failed, you know, you're having to change something because it's failed. And I think now is a very distinct opportunity to try new things without this burden that it's, it will be seen as a failure if it doesn't work and that you have to change. Renee's, uh, Renee's word of the day yesterday was spontaneity. Well, I love that. I mean, I'm all about spontaneity, much what, to my um, husband. <laughs> <Chad Graham. laughs> what does what does spontaneity mean for you right now uh remaining open and then being able to be maximally responsive in any given moment i think that's that's what it would mean yeah being open to new things being open to something that may seem wacky or um, embarrassing or humiliating, just trying, yeah. I think that's such a nice place to, to finish. I could talk to you all night and probably would. There's plenty of people here who have just been commenting that they've just been oh. loving hearing from you. It breaks my heart, Helen, that we couldn't have hung out in Melbourne this year, but we will I know, I'm so sorry. Pat's first rodeo. I mean, I was <sighs> like, oh gosh. But what, a, what an amazing initiative to, to do this because it's made it so much more accessible to so many more people around the world. So thank you. And thank you for your vision to I, in, in doing this. I can't thank you enough. Um, in our closing moments, the Instagram's got the clock ticking on me now. Oh. Uh, I have to thank the Bank of Melbourne, who are our principal partners at the Melbourne Food and Wine Festival. I have to thank Visit Victoria, who are the destination partners for the festival. I really want to thank so many of you in Australia for showing up late in the evening um, on, a, on a Tuesday night, let alone early in the morning, wherever you are around the world. But hugest biggest most major melbourne food and wine festival online edition thanks to you helen go for joining us it has been such a pleasure talking to you i pleasure, apologize Pat. to the people who said i talked too much at the beginning it was because i was nervous because Can i was I ask meeting you one something? of my food Can heroes please Absolutely. how do you read and how do you talk because you look like you're looking at me but how have you been reading the comments <laughs> they are coming up if you brush your finger slightly up on the comments. They will come up oh, the screen. All right. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, see, it's my new, it, this is a, yeah, brave new frontier for me, Instagram. Right, right. now there's a lot of clapping and people saying, Helen oh. Go is amazing. Oh. Get rid of the guy <laughs> with the beard. Why is she sharing a screen with this drongo? On that note, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I will leave you.
um, Helen Go, it's been a pleasure. We'll see you in Melbourne soon. Good night, world. Thanks so much. See you, Bye. See you later. Ciao.